Well, welcome to Eric's Perspective. Uh, we're joined today by, at M. Hanks Gallery by George Evans, accomplished artist, photographer, and friend. As a matter of fact, George, I thought we could start out by just kind of reminding me even. It's been, we've been knowing each other for a really long time. And I was trying to remember the circumstances that we met. Uh, do you recall? <laughs> Actually, I do. Um, I was referred to you by... Cecil Ferguson, <laughs> and uh, I was working. I was working in an ad agency up on uh, Olympic and Bundy, and he mentioned that you were in Santa Monica at that time on Main Street. Yes, and so one day after work, uh, I mean, I had made this determination that I was going to get out of advertising agency and into the galleries and I needed to get in the gallery and a good brother to open that door yeah. and it was you. Oh, excellent. I, I remember you, cause you were on uh, Main Street. And Hill probably, was it the small Hill, space? The small space, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I still, that was a beautiful little space. I loved it. Cause you had the, the uh, elliptical doors. Yes, yes, yes that's a very <laughs> good memory. You know, it's so funny because that was from 1988 to 93. So Jeez, we, we met some many years ago. Oh, I mean, uh, yep. Yeah, so, and then I moved down to uh, the second space on Main Street. On Main Street. In 93. Right. So, and but we hooked up uh, while we were in that little small space. In that's that awesome. little small, small space, you started looking at my works. Yes. And then... Uh, you started showing me when you moved down the street, and uh, it's been on ever since then. So it has been a, a wonderful uh, friendship. I Excellent. Excellent. I couldn't agree more, man. This has been rewarding. Love every minute. Because you've helped me with the photography part, too. I mean, I doubt oh, we shared photography. a lot. We shared a lot of, you yeah. shared a lot of your uh, skills and techniques and so forth. So I appreciate that. I love doing that with you. Yeah, I mean, it has been um, one of the things to be able to share the knowledge that we can... Uh, you know, do the kind of things that we need to be doing as some folks. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, George, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself. I know that um, you you can't come from basically an artistic family, if I'm not mistaken, right? Right. Uh, my dad, my dad was a commercial artist, and he did a lot of signage and print printing. And then uh, my uh, older sister, uh, Wanda Coleman, was a poet and writer and uh, was quite heavily published. And then my younger brother and sister are both musicians. And so uh, we were encouraged. Me, uh, we all had to work in the shop uh, my, with, with my dad. And then again, we all had to take music according to my mother. Uh, oh. Music and me did not so much agree. <laughs> <laughs> I found myself drawing more. Yeah. And so the sign shop for me more or less paid off. So uh, when I think about the, the times of coming up, because actually when uh, my dad started training me in sign painting when I was nine years old. Oh, wow. He put a brush in my hand and said, make a line. So would that, what is it safe to say that your first art instructor was really your dad? Yeah. He was at Frank Wiggins, which became Trade Tech before, when it was a technical school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his orders for me were, you go to Trade Tech, you have a choice, sign graphics or commercial art. And since I grew up in the sign shop, I decided to do commercial art. And uh, I knew I would need to make a living, some kind of living with the arts. And uh, he had a lot of publications and things, signs of the Time Magazine and communication arts publications and things like this that I had the exposure to. But I also, um, as I was coming of age, he would send me to work, like in junior high, he sent me to work for the local printer. Uh, Mr. Carter's printing, and uh, I learned letterpress and the basics. And then in high school, he sent me to work for uh, Mr. Larry Valentine, who had a photo uh, salon in Compton. So was that your introduction to photography? That was my introduction. I did the darkroom uh, printing. I did the retouching. I did print finishing. I did 
pretty much everything with the exception of I was starting to, he was starting to teach me how to shoot. And that about that same time was when uh, things were changing. And Tudor Arts, after the 65 insurrections, mm -hmm. uh, Tudor Arts came about. <clears throat> uh, John Otterbridge had his program that was actually right down the street from us on uh, Rosecrans. And so Mrs. Valentine's kind of sent me down to uh, meet John. And that was my first introduction to John and Willie Middlebrook. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and so, this is this is in Watts we're talking about, right? Yeah, this is Watts, Com Watts Compton. Watts Compton, yeah. Yeah. And but, by the way, one little footnote, your sister Wanda uh, Coleman, uh, she actually interviewed me for the Los Angeles Times Magazine <laughs> way back when. It was uh, pretty pretty amazing to see how all these things kind of connect up. But That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, she sure did. And uh, I guess we, we should point out, though, that she passed away. Uh, in uh, November of 2013. 2013, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so she sorely missed, but uh, anyway, definitely. I, I do have that memory of her. So, um, so, you, so you're in Watts, and you um, hooked up with John Otterbridge, Willie Milderbrook, who's also no longer with us, by the way, sad to say. But right. He was, yeah, miss him. So and would you say those were some of the early, uh, earliest influences uh, on your art? Uh, outside of your father, of course, and introduction to the photography. Yeah, it came pretty much through through high school. I was at uh, Fremont, and what was interesting um, during the again the '65 insurrection, um, I was in it was summer school in August, and uh, we heard about it, and they would. They, over the PA system, they said, oh, y'all go home now. <laughs> of course, where do you go? Right, right. We went home and got on our bikes and went straight down to <laughs> Imperial and Avalon. Oh, wow, okay. And, you know, we, me and a couple of my friends sensed the danger, so we was like, okay, some bad is happening, so let's go on back home. Right. But uh, that same weekend, my dad was working on 103rd Street, we were painting a rendering of a medical building right at 103rd in Compton. Mm -hmm. And the other end of 103rd, the west end of it, was on fire. Oh so my goodness. basically we were working through the whole time of... So even while the building was on fire, you guys well, were out there still working? We were still working. Wow. My dad uh, said we can't afford to stop. Wow. So we had to, I mean, he, he would have an old, he had an old station wagon, mm -hmm. put the ladders on top, had the paints in the back of the, you know, uh, back seats, and we we worked right through it. We had scaffolding set up. We were on a, a I'll never forget that because uh, I got down in between, uh, you know, doing doing my work. Uh, I met Noah Purefoy, oh, wow. and he was collecting pieces of melted bottles and things of this nature. So I was seeing these things. I was, I mean, I was 16, 17. So I'm still basically a young kid who was kind of finding my way. Yeah. And um, right after that in high school, uh, these two artists came in, Bill Tara and uh, William Pajot, and they were recruiting for Tudor Arts. Oh, wow. So, so William Pajot was part of that effort to recruit. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Right. <laughs> it, has, it's, it has been interesting because once uh, I was accepted into the program after it started in, at, in GSM's uh, basement and then they moved it to, or the auditorium, then they moved it to uh, Chenard, to the old Chenard campus, oh, okay. which is Cal Arts. Okay. When it was on Seventh Street, that's yeah. when I joined the program, and for me, that was that was Seventh Heaven, man. So, was Bill Pajot an instructor in the program too? Uh, did you take uh, any art lessons from him? Not Bill was. Bill wasn't the instructor, but Bill was a mentor. He was he was the director, oh. because Bill had the Bill had the space and the materials. Bill Tara was a very successful commercial artist, graphic designer, 
uh, he was known in the advertising field as a cartoonist. He did a number of different things. And he had a, his studio was across the park, up off of Park View. And we used to go sometimes after uh, the class up to his studio. And uh, my instructor actually was John Riddle. John Riddle? Riddle, yeah. Wow. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, we would have uh, drawing classes in the morning and then advertising and different uh, cartoonists and animators and people would come in because the program was geared to teach us to make a living as artists. Okay. And so it wasn't so much that you had to be a fine artist, but you had to know, basically we were taught the arts, period. So kind of like the basics, like uh, mm-hmm. technique and uh, yeah, composition we, and... All the rules Color, of the theory. All the rules all, of the theory. Yes. Right. And so, More the theoretical stuff. But you would get it in the morning, we would do figurative works, and in the afternoon you had the advertising. That's when our, like Archie Boston would come in, and uh, you had Marv Rubin, Dave Brain. You had these artists from Hanna-Barbera that would come in. So no way. Some of the guys were geared to do in-betweens for... Uh, Hanna Barbera. Some of them got opportunities to do that. So that's more cartooning then, right? It's drawing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they covered the full spectrum. Right. It was when when I look back at it, it opened our eyes to just about every facet of the arts. Period. Wow. Because spending that time when John Riddle walked into that drawing uh, room, uh, I knew uh, what I could do. I mean, seeing some. You know, when, you, when you're seeing people who look like you, then you assume that you can do it too. <laughs> yeah, it's encouraging. <laughs> it's encouraging, yeah. You don't have yeah. to second guess. Yeah, it's inspirational, so, I would imagine, as well. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, John Riddle, uh, there was another uh, uh, Latino artist, Jesse Gutierrez, who was also there. Uh, they were the instructors during my time. I was in the first generation of Tudor Arts. And and actually the connection was to Charles White, too. Oh, wow. Because really that whole concept uh, came through Charlie. Charlie was the catalyst oh. who connected Bill Tara, who had the deep pockets, and... Uh, let me give you a little snippet of who Bill Terror was. Okay. Bill Terror was, he was mixed. He was, I believe, Irish and Jewish. But he started as a janitor in an ad agency, right? Mm-hmm. And he, he <clears throat> had this style of drawing. But anyway, he, he, he eventually got into the advertising arena. Uh, he made a pitch to General Motors in how... Women bought cars by color. They literally, and, and to get their attention, he put his cigar out on their conference table. <laughs> <laughs> you mean he ground it so that it was no longer lit? That's well, how it, exactly. That's what <laughs> so he exactly. basically he basically damaged their <laughs> their conference, their conference. million dollar conference table. He went into General Motors and did this. I bet that got their attention. <laughs> it it got him a blank check and the first Corvette to roll off the assembly line. Oh my goodness. So, so hearing these stories, Marv Rubin, who was also an, an animator and cartoonist, uh, we had the exposure to a number of the different artists that had an impact. Uh, so to me, and, and this, is how, this is, how, is how I built my portfolio but, uh, to get into Cal Arts, but Charlie introduced Bill to Bill Paggio, to William Paggio. Oh, wow. Okay, so I see what so you mean by catalyst. I mean, he was basically all, hooking people up. Exactly. Bringing all the chemistry together yeah. to make his dream come true. Oh, my God. And how did John Riddle get into it? And we should say, by the way, that John Riddle was an accomplished artist himself, and he was formerly, uh, uh, up until the time he passed away what? in 2002, he was a curator at the California at, African American Museum. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. he's just a beautiful person. He was great. Yeah. He was great. I mean, I, I, I never... Uh, he... he He had an impact on me as as an artist. uh, uh, He would take us out drawing. Yeah. And the painting that he did of the domino paint, of the domino players. Oh, yeah. In uh, the park. Yeah. That came from a drawing session that we were all at, at, uh, oh, what was that park over on Avalon? 
uh, Green Meadows. Okay. And uh, we would go out street drawing. And so that was a session, and I remember, so I saw the evolution of that process. Wow. And so to me, that, that program, uh, at times, I think I got more than anybody else out of that program because I, d- I decided that uh, I was going to replicate it some kind of way uh, as, as it moved on. But when, when uh, that program again got, helped me prepare my work to enter, which I won a full scholarship to Chenard or mm-hmm. CalArts, mm-hmm. and I placed third in this national competition. And so, I mean, I, I looked out, and um, that opened the door for me then to go in and also teach the program. Uh, at Chenard? At, at Chenard. Oh, wow. So the program, it moved from the CalArts campus across the park to Otis, mm-hmm. and that's when the second generation, Richard Wyatt, uh, Kali Lowe, a lot of the uh, art, some of the artists that were in the uh, student exhibition of Charles White mm-hmm. uh, that were from Tudor Arts, we were able to locate. Some of them, unfortunately, Charles Page had passed away, but there were a number of us that uh, from Tudor Arts that were a part of that. That was... Uh, that all came. That was the connection to Charlie and and you know watching Ian. <laughs> he was a little boy. Yeah, right, right. And we're talking <laughs> so, about Ian White, Ian uh, White. Tra- Charles White's uh, mm-hmm. son. Yeah, son. Yeah. And so, all of that connection over the years, you know, you look at the changes. I mean, that's just an amazing experience. I'm thinking because here you had this opportunity to be amongst these giants in art. Yeah. Charles White, John oh. Riddle. I it, mean, Noah Pure for it. I mean, this is amazing. It, it was, you know, it, you would take it for granted. Yeah. You know, you know I, when I look back I, and living on 89th Street and I did not meet Cecil Ferguson for some 20 years really formally as in the arts, mm-hmm. but I knew him as a neighbor. I knew him as because I would walk past his house <laughs> and he would, you know, he, he would be out in the yard doing something and I always acknowledge him. But you never knew that he was connected Hadn't, in any way to the arts? No. Wow. Not until uh, Richard called me one day and said, you have to meet Cecil. R- Richard Wyatt. Right. Yeah. So I said, okay. And uh, he brought him over. We sat down and had breakfast and coffee. And, and Cecil goes, where did you live? And I said, on 89th Street. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, where on 89th Street? <laughs> And I said, east of McKinley. He said, I was west of McKinley. And I said, you were the man that had that black and white Buick. <laughs> he said, yeah, that was me. <laughs> knew, knew right where he was. Oh, my goodness. Had seen him often enough. Wow. And he knew, you know, when you start naming, oh, there was the Smith's kids down the street. And you go, yeah. You know, oh, well, right. all, all the kids in the block who you knew. Right. And it's like, yeah, we lived in the middle, right, you know on the same side of the street, just down in the next block. Oh, my goodness. And so to tie that together, uh, that opened up a special relationship that went on until he passed on. You know, so uh, the connection to uh, Bill Pajot, uh, because uh, from Tudor Arts, and I went, uh, I had started trade tech uh, from high school. And when I won the scholarship, I had, uh, was already in my going into my second semester mm-hmm. at Trade Tech, and so uh, I was basically I tr- became I was a transfer student, uh-huh. and uh, in between that, uh, I decided to uh, there were there were activities going on at uh, the the uh, Studio Watts was forming. And uh, my sister introduced me to uh, Jim Woods, who was the director of that facility. So would that sister be Wanda? That's Wanda. Okay. And so all, all of this is that 60s time. Mm-hmm. So I'm working for Mr. Valentine, uh, going to trade tech. Uh, I went to the drawing instructor and got his model list, went to, the, went to Jim Woods at Studio Watson and started a drawing program. I got one of my other buddies, John Whitmore. Uh, Interested, and so the both of us, as John, if you want to participate, we can start this drawing program on Sunday afternoons at mm. Studio Watts, mm. and we did that. That got us a grant to go to Stanford for a summer. Uh, 
just before I went and won the scholarship to Cal Arts, I won the Ford Foundation grant to go study at Stanford under uh, Nathan Oliveira and Frank Lipdell and an artist named Keith Boyle. So what made you switch from Cal Arts or Chenard to uh, to trade tech for uh, a dream. <laughs> 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 we used to have art form in our art classroom, right? Right. <laughs> and I used to look at that magazine, and, and you look at the back of it, yeah. and there's the art schools, right? Right. And you go, no way. <laughs> I, I could never afford Art Center, Cal Arts, or Otis. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> okay. I knew it right off, coming out the gate. If I did trade tech, I was good. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could hang in there. I could hang. I no. could make a living as a graphic designer. I'm, I'm thinking graphic design is, you know, you, you make a living and you go home and do what you do. You right. know, and it's like I knew I, I always drew, yeah. you know, and, and I love photography. My my dad was slick. He was, he, you know, me and my <laughs> brother, we kick it at times in there and we go, yeah, Pops was a genius because he knew where to put us. <laughs> So he understood. He understood, you know, who you guys were and where your talents lay, and right. He just uh, so channeled he, you in those directions. Yeah, he he just so he, f for me, it's like here you, you have a craft, and I'm gonna put you over here with this printer, put you over here with this photographer. I'm not gonna buy you the camera. <laughs> I'm gonna let you go work for it. Right, right. And sure enough, you know, I, I bought my first camera it was the Instamatic. You know, and it was from Pawn Shop right down the street from the Portrait Studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started taking uh, pictures. Uh, the interesting part uh, during that time was while I was at Trade Tech, uh, I met this poet. I was kind of looking to sprout my wings mm -hmm. so uh, I met this poet John Thomas through a fellow student who I was who to me at that time was a little bit to the left I'll say politically very yeah. very bohemian oh okay okay <laughs> <laughs> a hippie maybe or a beatnik a, a, whatever. a hippie <laughs> and she introduced me to this poet big John Thomas and they had a basement up in Echo Park, and Big John said, "Well, if you clean it up, you can stay there." So I so cleaned could, it up, and uh, and you I'm, used it as a studio. And I used it as a studio. Oh, That's wow. where I met uh, in Echo Park. Suzanne Jackson lived was living in Echo Park, and she was going to Otis, oh, and yeah. I and I was teaching at uh, Otis on Saturdays while I was going to Cal Arts. So that whole chemistry. So is this is this like in the seventies we're talking about? This is in the late sixties, early seventies. Yeah. Late 60s, early 70s. Okay. Yeah, so this is like 60. I went into Cal Arts in 69. Um, I finished in 72. Uh, so this is the time when I, 69 was when, yeah, I started, because I was at trade from, nine, from boy, what, 68, I think, 60, yeah, 67, 68. Okay. So I met Rose in about, yeah, about 68. Moved into the basement. Uh, I was at the studio Watts, uh, and, and that whole thing of uh, John Thomas used to edit the poetry for this poet Charles Bukowski, mm -hmm. <laughs> and Bukowski would come up uh, after he got off from the post office, and they would have these philosophical arguments and I had the exposure to this and I didn't know who Bukowski was right. and so I was hanging out with these Echo Park beatniks basically yeah. Stuart Perkoff, Paul Evangelisti there were all these different poets and they used to call me I was the black cat <laughs> <laughs> so wait did you, did you participate in the, the debate or argument or whatever it was I would listen. Oh, okay. I would listen because John John Thomas was was a man who was a poet who was known as a man who who had everything. He uh, he you used mean materially. To, yes, he used to he used to clip coupons. 
<laughs> for, for for whatever even anything, though he could even even though he could afford the items, he still clicked the he would click the, the coupons. coupons. He had totally dropped out of society. Oh, and so he was totally, boy, he was beatnik. Okay, a and Rose was a hippie. John was a beatnik. Okay, <laughs> and so John, uh, John and Bukowski would get together. John's walls were coated with newspaper clippings, and there was a narrow path because everything else was covered with something, books, papers, magazines, <clears throat> whatever it was. And from that time at uh, going to Cal Arts and being in Echo Park, and I think from, uh, it was that time when I won the, had started working with Studio Watts. Mm -hmm. That's when, and that's when I won the Ford Foundation grant to go up north. That expanded that showed me and opened up my eyes to what the art world was really all about. Right. You know, seeing, uh, 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 I would walk up the hill sometimes when I didn't have a car and I would pass Suzanne Jackson's place. Mm. And, you know, made it easy to meet folks. And especially at that time, because she's one of the few sisters of or some color that was up in Echo Park. Yeah. And so we would, you know, stop and talk. And she had this beautiful little apartment, this beautiful little house. And uh, uh, so I got, I got to know her. So that when she started uh, Gallery 32, mm -hmm. uh, she invited me to be in the show. I had just finished my second career, second year of uh, student works, and you had to produce a show. Was that your first uh, exhibit? Mm -hmm. Very first. And when you showed at my gallery... Well, I'm trying to remember the first time because you've shown many times in the gallery. I was trying to put it into some kind of time perspective. When when did you first show in my gallery? Do you remember? Shoot, man, I'm trying to remember. It's been a while ago. I know. <laughs> Tell me about it because I that had to be in the early '90s. Right, because I, that was that was in that same small space I was talking about earlier. Right, right, right. Yeah, and then we you know we moved down. I mean, the, the ultimate would. What, to, to me, was to have the show with me and Bill. You know, I was going to come to that because William Pajot, he, he plays prominent in L.A., <laughs> I mean, for a number of reasons, as a, as a mentor, as a source of inspiration, as, a, as an artist himself. Right. Very disciplined artist. I mean, he, he was always at the easel. Yeah. And um, <laughs> Golden State, his whole thing there, where he's the curator of a wonderful collection there that sadly well, all of that. got dissipated. But nevertheless, <laughs> he was very instrumental. And then you were just talking about him at uh, the Tudor Arts and all that. I mean, this is incredible. But in, I think Guess what? I, I think in 2009 is when we had that show where you showed watercolors and he showed water watercolor. Water we watercolor was one of his favorite uh, media for a long time. He hooked me. <laughs> yeah. So he's the one that got you kind of like connected up with this watercolor. Right. He knew my dad. Oh, he. Oh, okay. He, my dad had been a, a, a sales agent. For GSM. Oh, no kidding. Back in the day. Uh, GSM being Golden State, State uh, Mutual. Mutual Insurance Company. Yeah. Right. And so, and then from Tudor Arts, I started working with Bill because they, he needed a graphic designer to help him produce some material for oh, the department. The, the calendars that he was famous for starting. Calendars, brochures, brochures the, new, the golden pen. Yeah. I used to put all that together. Oh, no kidding. So during my f senior year, uh, as Tudor Arts was beginning to go through some different changes because primarily between Bill Terra, Bill Terra was, had developed cancer. Uh, GSM, Bill, were primarily Bill Pajor. They were pretty much supporting that program. Uh -huh. And I can remember the time when Bill was kind of saying it's kind of coming to a close because nobody could feel Bill Terra's uh, deep pockets. Right. And um, Charlie was uh, was still at Otis, but the program all about that time was when the program kind of came to a close. Came to a close. But I was working with, you know, it opened up an opportunity for me to go into GSM right from school. So I walked out with my degree right into a job. Oh, so you worked for Golden State? Yeah, I freelanced. I oh, mean, I it, it, gave, it gave me a foundation in which to start a career. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's okay. Bill. 
You know, oh, wow. So, I, mean, I didn't realize that. That's, yeah. That's fantastic. Well, we, you know, you can't decide on who's your friend. <laughs> <laughs> right. It just, sometimes it just happens, right? I mean, it happens, yeah. yeah. And, and so, I mean, I never, you know, Bill was always there sponsoring the program. And Bill was always, so when anything was needed, materials or anything was needed, Bill had it. And then going going into GSM as a graphic designer, I think that, that gave me a whole different scope of seeing how the, that's really where I learned about my, about our history, black, African-American, African-American art. Well, you know, it's just the most incredible story, though, uh, just to wind back for a second. Golden State Insurance Company itself founded by blacks right. to provide insurance to black people who couldn't really get insurance anywhere else. Anywhere else. And it's just amazing. And they hire a black architect, Paul Williams, right. to design the building. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Get Charles Austin and Hale Woodruff, two prominent black Harlem uh, Renaissance to do those murals. To do the murals, <laughs> you know what triggered this was you saying about the history because the murals actually told the story of the contributions of blacks from the time before it became a state. I mean, all the way back to when That's right. Spain. That's right. Controlled uh, the area. It, th that area yeah. exactly. And so it was really just fascinating. Walk. I can remember walking in the lobby. And you look up to the right, and there's from 1600 to whatever 1900, and then look to the left, and from there, from it that point, the other, yeah. to uh, I think it was about the late 1940s when this, the company was founded. Right. So, I mean, that's just to me, it's just an, it was such an incredible resource. They they would actually have uh, organized tours. I I realized <clears throat> that that's where my education came from me and Richard Wyatt, we still talk about our our education came from Tudor Arts. Yeah. Going to Cal Arts was was informative. It was nice. You're learning what you the theories and the technical principles. skills basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're getting the creative you're getting the stuff. Yeah. But really the essence and the real information and the real material and the things that I needed as an individual and as an artist really came through Tudor Arts, GSM, that history with GSM. Sure. Uh, the con finding out the connections later on to what my father had yeah. with Bill, that they knew each other. Well, you know, and here's the I other mean, here's the other thing too. By the way, uh, did you ever have any interaction with uh, Wendell Collins? Because I know. That, oh yeah. That that <laughs> that, that uh, fire station that he maintained was just down the street from the Golden State Mutual Insurance Company. Exactly, and, and, and it was and, a workshop, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah, yeah. went went uh, right after the '92 insurrections was when it. It hit me uh, when Charlie passed away uh, and Tudor Arts folded. A number of different artists tried to step up to fill those shoes. Mm -hmm. And nobody could really, really do it. The program struggled along and it gradually kind of dissipated. Yeah. After the 92 insurrection, I, I was sitting uh, as an art director at the, while well, I was working for this British agency called Austin Knight. And... Uh, looked out the. My wife came in and says, "Look out the window," <laughs> and I oh, turn around. And you smoke. can see plumes of smoke going yeah. up across the city. Right. And I decided at this time it, it's it's time to do something. You you have the advent of the computer and technology changing. Uh, I said I have to volunteer, and I saw an ad in the the, the L.A. Times. They were looking for artists to volunteer for the city, and I went out and I volunteered. I met. Uh, three ladies or two ladies that uh, the city introduced me to that we formed a group we started recruiting kids we did a EDD mural down in uh, uh, Compton right on the border of South Central and Compton mm -hmm. at, right around the corner from the Magic Johnson's Park and uh, we organized these kids and took them I found uh, moved to the towers for a while and then moved over to uh, uh, the fire station with Wendell Collins. Yeah, and you know it's so funny because um, Wendell Collins played it in it played in it to uh, for me in a big way when I my very first exhibit was Elizabeth Catlett and she had all these prints in a wooden box at Wendell's place. <laughs> so once she agreed to uh, be my first exhibiting artist at the small space on Main Street in Santa Monica in 1988, yes. I had to go see Wendell. That's how I met him in the first place. Wow, because, see, again, it was through through Bill yeah. 
uh, that opened up the door. Richard ne- Richard needed a place to work, large scale. And I had these kids, and we were talking to Bill, and Bill said, you got to go over to Wendell's. And I remember seeing, actually seeing um, Richard Wyatt's work on a sort of a, like an easel. And he was like in the middle of doing this one son, kind of a big piece. That was at, a at, Union Station piece. At, yeah, at, at, at Wendell's place. Right. Yeah, that was, that, really, that was when we were forming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's just incredible to think back on that. Wendell was such a beautiful person and a master. He was incredible. A master <laughs> printer, too. A lot of oh, folks don't realize. He was a great man. Yeah, I mean, he was just fabulous. He had so much of L.A. history. And if there were, when, you know, when you look at what, what I see now that's falling into the cracks that needs to be preserved. Yeah. He is somebody who was not documented enough. Oh, I totally agree. He, he knew, uh, he knew things that I had uh, little inclinations of. The first, one of the first Eidelberg printing presses was owned by a black man. That was Mr. Colton, and uh, Wendell schooled me on that as well as lots of other things yeah. uh, from the history of the Civil War and things of these natures. Well, he showed, me, he showed me some lithographs that <laughs> were printed of you know, the Civil War and so forth. And yeah. Wendell did. We, we used to have, there were some special times that, uh, that, that, that uh, again, his relationship to Bill, the watercolors, yeah. the... Um, oh, what's her name? Ike, Ike Blocker, uh, Melanie Blocker. Oh, uh, who was also uh, lived across the street yeah, from, from the fire station. Oh, from the fire station, yeah. And um, Bill had introduced Melanie Wendell uh, to watercolors, and and so me and Wendell, Wendell would have the Thursday night drawing group. And we, they would, he would schedule models, and we would get together and draw. Sometimes other uh, group was just me and Window. And I tell you, those were some of the best times you could ever have as an artist. That sounds really cool. It, it I'm was, getting chill bumps <laughs> listening to you describe it. <laughs> it, was, it was great because it would just be the, the two of us. Yeah. And we'd have a model, and we would go back and forth. And it's like, well, what do you want to do? What do you... What, do you like this angle? Or how do you want her to pose? Yeah. And just as it was working with the master. Yeah, yeah. And so from we would have these sessions. We had three or four or five of these sessions by just the two of us, and we'd split the bill. Wow, that's and, cool. And, yeah, it was, it, was, it was something that was so rare, but yes, yeah, so beautiful and so wonderful because with that space, when you saw, when, uh, you saw uh, Richard working on that, the, those panels. Yeah. Uh, what we did was, as students would come in to the program, uh, they were challenged to work up to working with Richard. So they had to earn the right. And there were two young men, Rudy Mendez and Jose Ramirez, and both of them are extremely successful artists today, but uh, they were very competitive. It was the tortoise and the hare. <laughs> and I mean, it was wonderful watching a number of these these young, talented kids coming in yeah. and just excelling to then move up to that level. And these two moved up to that rank to where they, Richard hired them to work on the, the Union Station oh. pieces. Oh, okay. And... Um, both of them now. Jose has a very successful company where he's doing a lot of the major uh, projects throughout the city now. He yeah. has uh, Trios, which is in Burbank, and uh, him and this artist who used to be at uh, Scenic Artists at Warner Brothers. It's strange they created their own shop now, oh, okay. and they're doing a lot of big work. And Rudy works with them, and Rudy is all over the country now doing murals. Oh, and wow. so both of them are still very he's active. He's in demand, in other words. Right. A number of the kids that came out of that program, um, Renault Jett is designer in New York, uh, two little brothers, uh, Adam and um, um, Jonas, Aaron, they're both in England, and one's in Scotland, the other's in England, and they're both 
Successful. working at large. Yeah. So I mean, seeing these, you know, what kids that had fallen into the cracks in high school, and you put them on the right track, and you watch what they do. And That's got to be gratifying, though, to see. Yeah, it's to see wonderful that, that development, and evolution. Yeah, it's because it, they they don't forget. Right. right. <laughs> so, that's that's also that's also very encouraging to hear too. I mean, yeah, I see them on the internet now, or I yeah. see them, you know. So I see their progress. I see what they're doing. It, it, it's you know that they they've taken it. They've taken the strides. They worked their way into the field. It's well, George, I want to take them. you back to this whole watercolor thing because I remember Bill Pajo one time telling me how. One of the reasons he liked watercolor so much was the spontaneity of it. I mean, other, I mean, unlike oil painting where you can kind of change things because the paint can, you know, takes a while to dry and so forth. You can kind of alter your course mm-hmm. almost in the middle of it. But with watercolor, you yeah. don't have that luxury. Uh, once you lay it down, it's it. And then sometimes <laughs> it can go in a direction you never expected it to. And I think for one of the things I appreciated by about uh, Bill was that he actually was able to... Um, sort of work with it. He knew how to anticipate what was going to happen and it somehow worked. Is that a, would you say that's an accurate <laughs> yes. description of him? And I was just wondering, with, with you, what was it that was so attractive about watercolor for you? I mean, I still remember making the connection. I mean, this is years later. I mean, uh, the time that I had with Bill was, was, was really incredible and it was really unique uh, because at uh, the times at GSM I used to hear him talking to uh, Romare Bearden and he would be talking to all these different you know uh, artists and I'm, superstar I'm artists yeah, yeah right and I'm just I'm, you know I'm right outside the door and they all <laughs> say come on in and, yeah. and, and let me participate but after work we would go over to his studio and uh, he would break out the watercolors or he'd get out or he'd, and, and even at GSM uh, we were always, it's like you had to have that sketchbook, and that sketchbook was a monitor from Tudor Arts. In order to stay a part of that program, you had to have that sketchbook. And so much of the lessons that still allowed me to become who I am comes from that thing of the, the sketchbooks. And then one day, and this is years later, I mean, this is, you know, Bill had been, Push me work with the watercolor, work with the watercolor. I said, yeah, 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 yeah. I like this camera. <laughs> you know, it's like, so one day I picked up this brush and it was the same brush my dad taught me to letter with. Oh, wow. And Bill was using it to watercolor with. Oh, wow. And it's like when, when Bill showed me that brush and it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me back up a minute. And it's like, okay. You're on. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for an an avenue because you know I'm a I'm a mature professional now as an art director, but not satisfied with the work, right. and I knew I had to do me. So the watercolor was perfect. Uh, I started working with the drawing group. And I started doing figurative watercolor. And it was that one inch flat. And then You're I was describing the brush, you mean? That brush. Flat. Yeah, yeah. That brush was called the one inch flat. It was, and Bill, the one that Bill held, it was a Grumbacher. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll never forget. Yeah, yeah. Same exact brush. <laughs> My dad had me because. You could take, sign painters will use a brush by its width if it's a half inch, three quarter inch, one inch. Okay. Right? Bill would use a one inch flat because of the versatility of how you could use it, oh. how it carried the water, yeah, yeah. how it carried the color, yeah. and all the wonderful things. And I'm going, how can you do all of this with that brush that looks like a chisel? Because <laughs> logically, you would think, oh, you need a round, you need one of these, yeah, you yeah. need one of those. And yeah. it's like, Bill would go, no, 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 no. Watch this. <laughs> wow. And the, it was the magic. Yeah, it yeah. was the magic. So uh, I got into this thing of, it, it's like, let me go over here and see some more of what you're doing, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sucked you in, right? And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. So going back and forth, and then I, I realized it was, a, a, for me, it became kind of a form of, of it tied me back to really to Tudor Arts, because one mm-hmm. of the things that I had where it, 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 
it addressed something within me. I like doing. I liked figurative work. I like drawing a figure. Mm-hmm. And I used to kind of duck out of the graphics classes because I had all that from trade. Yeah. I'd go to the drawing classes. Right, right. <laughs> and so for me, I, I developed this love of figurative art. Yeah. And so I found this group of artists that I could work with and the watercolors worked fine. Yeah. So I more or less, it drew me into a direction to where I could address my need and be creative and I could develop it. And then I started pushing it even further. Yeah. It has the, the, the influences of it uh, carry over to when I did, you know, go back into the studio and start doing some canvases. The watercolor comes with you. Right. You know, even if I'm doing something digital now, right. the watercolor's there too. Yeah. You know, it, it's the feeling, uh, which is why I, I, I love the idea of going from the traditional hand scales to the digital. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a nice transition because um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, too. So that's kind of where you are now, but it's not new to you now. But, I mean, you're doing it now, right? Where mm-hmm. you're blending your uh, great photography skills, your artistic skills in drawing and painting, but now also you're incorporating the digital aspect of it. So tell us a little bit about that. It's strange things <laughs> along my lifeline. Uh, in the 60s, you remember that movie, uh, Dustin Hoffman, uh, The Graduate? The Graduate, yeah. Yeah, right? Right. Plastics. Oh. Uh, plastics retired my dad. We made our living brush lettering. Yeah. Signage was not uh, up until the 60s when plastics came out, uh, we did very well with walls and trucks and windows and everything so else. So basically but, they were hand-painted the signs, basically, mm-hmm. is what you're saying. But how it, did plastics uh, have that impact? It, I'm curious. It went to these, neon, not neon, but the fluorescent signs where you built the cans. So you had to have sheet metal equipment. Oh, now you have to be a certified electrician with the city. Oh boy! So you had to, then you had to have boom trucks. You had to have all of this equipment. Oh boy! So my dad was too far along in age, and the thing that happens with sign painters at a certain part, you fall. Right. And he started falling, and he knew he couldn't keep up. And he asked me, "Do you want the shop?" And I said, "Thanks, but no thanks." Right. And um, uh, when I saw that happen to him. And I came out of school, and I was working, so I was at GSM with Bill, mm-hmm. and I watched metal change to film. And from working with photography, I understood film. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of graphic design went to film, and I understood it. Right. And when I left, after I, after I kind of moved out of GSM and started my own practice, I realized that hmm, I need additional skill sets and to keep myself afloat. So I started working as a retoucher, which I had learned from Mr. Valentine. And I worked in commercial uh, photographic firms. So by retouching, you mean, so say a photograph was taken and you just want to juice it up here and tone it down there, you would literally go in and, and take care of that kind of thing. Right, and it was all done by hand. So it was all done with brushes and paint. And would picks. that be airbrushes? Yes, yeah. airbrush, uh, hand painted. It would be, uh, you'd use pencils and dyes. And, and nowadays it's computer. It's all computer. So I did that for a number of years. I also, uh, a couple of the firms I worked for, they had process cameras, so these large cameras that you had to shoot graphic arts film. Mm-hmm. So I did a number of working in these types of facilities before uh, I moved into the advertising arena. And again, I was thankful because that was Bill right. who made the connection to a young brother who had landed a position at uh, J. Walter Thompson that uh, was looking for an art director. And I took that, so that position. That's one of the, that used to be anyway, one of the biggest uh, advertising agencies, right? Yeah. They still, they're they still big. they still big. Right. They still, you know, I look at them periodically since I'm in the classroom teaching this stuff, but yeah, they're so, still big. So but. George, what is it about the digital 
thing now that attracts you as an artist? You know, it was when, when I saw the industry changing and I saw what happened to my dad, I, and again, and part of two, that's part of two the arts, uh, there was a philosophy uh, of stay current, oh, okay. keep up, right. you know, stay up on your game. Right. And um, seeing the changes of what happened to my dad, it's like, I'm going to keep up. Mm -hmm. So what I found interesting within my lifetime, these skills and the things that I've come across are the things that came out of my dad's shop, the, the, the watercolors, <laughs> the photography from Mr. Valentine that my dad put me with mm -hmm. the, from working with the local printer. Mm -hmm. All of these, all the skills that I pretty much acquired uh, introduced me to the computer. Uh, and at the time that the, uh, the Mac came out just as I was leaving uh, Jay Walter and going to, I stopped off at another small shop and then went to the, this British agency was moving into LA and I helped them build their art department. And they had a little Mac 512. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so I found some resources to put it online yeah. and, and, and started uh, figuring out how to use it. And to well, me, you, I, I've seen the stuff you've created. I mean, it's really pretty spectacular how you've blended all these different media and then kind of combined it with the digital aspect to create something unique. And it kind of, yeah. I know Willie, Willie Middlebrook was kind of along the same lines, right? He was right. pretty much extensively using, he was a very accomplished photographer, but he, he was very, accomplished. very, very much into the, uh, the digital right. uh, art right. of it as yeah. well. Yeah, we yeah. used yeah, we used to... Uh, a uh, talk, yeah. a and I used to get a kick out of out of the, uh, our conversation because uh, I would be sometimes sitting up in the ad agency late at night, and 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 I'd call Willie, and we'd be talking about cameras, and 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 we would be kind of comparing notes. Yeah, and uh, he was, you know, it was, it was inspiring. Yeah, because sure. then you're you're pushing each other. Oh yeah, absolutely. So looking at the works that he was doing. Um, I, my path and the way I've worked, I think I have been kind of all over the place rather than specializing in one particular type of medium. And so for me, I have found that by, uh, from the painting to the drawing to the photography and how they have all culminated. It's funny that they have kind of fallen into this digital Thing that I seem to use a lot, and I think of myself now as a, a contemporary printmaker because I like running these Epson prints, but I'm curious about projecting and motion graphics now and looking at what I can possibly do with some of the subject matter. Excellent. So, George, uh, so you're working on, are you still doing watercolors today? I'm just trying to bring us to current. You're, you're obviously doing the digital art, but are you still also doing watercolor and drawing and so forth? Or? I usually, during the summer months, as it gets warm, I like to be outdoors, and that's where I break out the watercolors. Oh, okay. I, I try to keep my hand in, uh, I made a commit, a personal commitment to myself and that's to not relinquish my traditional drawing skills, my hand skills, the watercolor, the... So I have, and this all stems back to the basics, mm -hmm. why I still keep, uh, I still work in sketchbooks. So the watercolor is still there. Okay. Uh, I have a feeling that's small. probably, I was gonna say, it's probably <laughs> never gonna actually totally leave no. you. Mm -mm. Right. No, no, I, I keep, I keep, uh, uh, a, a small pocket set to to the tubes okay. of, of watercolors that can go with me everywhere. Yeah, a and I still like to go out and draw in public. Yeah, and, and so uh, I will do things that keep my hand skills in charge. Uh, you know, okay. I refuse to relinquish. Yeah, you can keep keeping uh, your chops up, basically. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, wor working. I realize working for an agency like like Jay Walter, you get consumed. Yeah. And when I got consumed, it's like something's wrong with this picture. Yeah. And then I realized, yeah, art's missing. Yeah. Right. And I realized, I I had basically I I, I lost my chops, and yeah. it's like let me go get them. <laughs> <laughs> Retrieve them exactly. Exactly. Now so, I remember not too long ago there was an excellent show that Vita uh, Brown put on at. Uh, 
uh, and we so- sorely miss her. I know she just oh, recently yeah. passed on, but uh, uh, tragically too soon. Yeah, tragically. But that, that was a great show. Uh, are, you, are there any other shows uh, in the offing? Uh, are you working on any, anything now? Uh, there's a show coming up at West L.A. for Black History Month. And um, I've been invited to submit some work to that, so I'm looking forward to that. Excellent. And, um, uh, boy, I miss Vita dearly because, yeah, she was a force. I mean, she was. Know, and I, yeah. should, I should add, I mean, she and I go way back. I mean, you do. Because <laughs> I met her through you. Exactly. So that was that same <laughs> small space you mentioned before back in the 80s and late 80s and early 90s is where she and I connected. And she right. worked at my gallery there. That not was, just yeah. there, but even after I moved, she still was working with me. So. Right. I mean, it was impressive to see her. You know, when 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 you think of the of artists today, but you look at the artists and what they have accomplished throughout their life, and seeing her as a young lady, yeah, and you know, assisting you in the gallery, yeah, and then what she took off and what she did with it. Oh my it was God! Amazing. And she ends up becoming a curator at Can- California African American Museum. It was actually really incredible. She, she paid the dues, and she was she was, she was dedicated and serious, no question about Very it. Very serious, yeah. So what about so, public art, George? Any uh, public art projects you're currently working on or will be working on? Well, the, the wrapping up this, uh, uh, coming kind of coming to the end of this uh, uh, Metro, I'm, which is my first uh, solo public arts piece, uh, I got into it from assisting Richard Wyatt with some of his, especially as, as things went digital, uh, when he redid Capitol Records building uh, was recommissioned uh, because it was a south facing wall and it faded over the years Mm -hmm. and he was recommissioned to redo it again Uh, he brought me his drawings and we scanned them in and we basically rebuilt that whole entire mural was built within the computer oh wow okay and so uh, I started thinking this is nice stuff yeah yeah (laughs) so for me, it's like, like so I, I put in, I, I started bidding on some projects, and I finally uh, won the Rosa Parks station. So, oh, congratulations. Yeah, the first one is, is finished. It should be up by now. I'm yeah. just kind of waiting for them to finalize when yeah. they're going to, you know, finish the building and open up the center. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing two, and I'm in the process of finishing the second one, which uh, I like both of them. And, and to me, they're... Uh, th- there's something uh, that defines who the community is. Mm-hmm. I wanted to brand Willowbrook with the first one. And thinking in terms of the experiences from my mentors, mm-hmm. primarily Cecil and Bill, right? Uh, I located some some of the prominent people who are making some significant changes and I included them into the first piece and the second piece is based on uh, on, on, on children coming up and I found this, uh, was able to get a photograph of these wonderful little tiny tots <laughs> that were at a groundbreaking at the Magic Johnson Park and, oh, cool. and, and I've built them into this piece that I'm getting ready to complete. Very cool. So I'm excited about the, the public arts and, and I'm putting my, uh, I'm kind of looking forward to doing more of th- that, that kind of thing. And, and kind of retiring from the full-time classroom, which, you know, I mean, that's trade it's, it's been wonderful teaching at trade. I love teaching students, but I think I'm at a part now where like Bill said, it's time for me to make my art. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> and and so, move to that next phase. And so anybody yes. wanting to see your art, uh, is there a website they can go to or is there other other places you can direct them? My website is uh, my name, all one word, which is all lowercase George Evans dot site. And, uh, site, S-I-T-E? S-I-T-E. You okay. Can, and so... Uh, I have that up. I have an Instagram, which is the original George E. And uh, I, I post there on occasions. Usually I will post there like if there's an announcement for something, I uh-huh. usually post it there. Uh, I'm, you know, a, a lot of this digital, I mean, I love technology. You know, I mean, for me, it's like it was made for me. Mm-hmm. But this is challenging. 
what young people have today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean with all the all the technical the, stuff? The changes happen so fast. Social media, right? Right. I, mean, I, I run my daughters all the time on Instagram and Snapchat and all these other kind of things. <laughs> There's a lot of avenues now for communication. Oh man, so hard to keep up with them. Yeah, so hard. But I mean, it's, but I am still. Uh, I moved into mirrorless photography, so I'm impressed with that. Looking at keeping up with what's going on. Well, wait, what is mirrorless photography? They have, it's like compressing information so that you get more, you get more detailed information into your image because they have the distance between the lens and the sensor, which replaced the film, mm -hmm. was with the DSLR, the digital uh, through the lens cameras, right. was further apart. They moved the mirror and the shutter. So now the lens sits a lot closer to the sensor. Oh. The amount of information that you record. Has increased. Uh -huh. So when you look at the image, you, you get a, a sharper, crisper. The detail that you can zoom in on hmm. is scary. Oh, really? <laughs> at times. Yes, I mean, just, before I ventured off into it, me and uh, Beatrice, we were, we were out shooting on the pier, and we run into this young man. He's got a Sony uh, mirrorless camera, and he goes, "Man, you got to see that. I'm shooting my girlfriend over here in a bathing suit, and you got to. It's unbelievable. You got to see this stuff, right?" Mm -hmm. And so it's like, "Yeah, okay." And I look at his image, and it's like, "Yeah, that's really nice," you know. So. Uh, being that I've been working with Nikon, I opted to stay with Nikon, so I ventured off into uh, a Z6 just at the time of the super bloom last year. And we went down to Anza Borrego. We went out to Antelope Valley to the Poppy Reserve. We shot pretty much. Now, the Poppy Reserve is like a gorgeous. I oh, mean, for beautiful. anybody wanting to uh, see some beautiful flowers, you go to the Poppy Reserve. It's just it's, it's amazing. saturated in color if you go the right time. It's usually in the spring, right? Right. Like yeah. March, it, yeah. It, it, it's mind boggling. I mean, when you when you think of the things that we don't see yeah. every day, you know, and that's to to me growing up in LA and the city, it's you know, right. the color is gray. Right. To see a gold against a blue sky. Yeah. You know, you're seeing colors and things that are just you never see in nature. Oh yeah. So to me that was just it was it's just amazing. it's just astonishing to see fields and rolling hills of just right. these beautiful colors. All of these things that that we take for granted, and then here they are, right there, and we yeah. they're, they're at our disposal. Yeah, just so, a little bit north of uh, L.A., right? I mean, that's right. Yeah. yeah, just heading over the hill to the Antelope Valley and up Avenue I, and you're yeah. there. Right. And I mean, so to me, the gracefulness of these rolling hills with all of this color was just unusual, and it's a chance to see it, document it. I include. Uh, some of these images are included in my images that I'm making. Oh, wow. So I, 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 I love compositing and taking pictures apart. All of these are things that when I think of how I grew up here, mm -hmm. you know, you start with collages and you're drawing and you're doing these things as a young artist. Mm -hmm. And they turn into who you are that become your your voice and, your, and how we communicate. So, I mean, I, you know, I see myself now making these, I call them digital poems, you know, because... Uh, part of it, especially after the loss of my sister, and when I think about where I've come from, it's like arranging things. I'm using surrealism, but to me, it allows me to tell different stories. You know, my sister was the writer. Uh, I like working with pictures. Yeah. So to me, I so I collect. Then again, it extends back to Watts with Simon Rodea. He went up and down the state, <laughs> right, collecting to put, stuff to put the Watts towers together. It's quite a remarkable thing. It's like a mostly found objects, right? I mean, right, right? all found. Yeah. So I go out, I I do mine. I just go click, click, click. Yeah. <laughs> then and I go home and take them apart and re-glue them together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's kind of like a montage, but you're doing it digitally. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So right. to to me, I you know I I I enjoy doing that and finding new things, and I find new textures. I find you know the things that I can put together, and they form different pictures, and it opens up different sensibilities. You know, so it's like seeing the world a little bit differently now causes a question to pop in my mind. So with that kind of a perspective, has it influenced your painting at all? Actually, it's, it's funny because I'm, um, 
again, the sketchbook comes in handy because what what I'm doing to, to again keep my chops up yeah. is I'm working with oil pastels. Oil pastels, you know, uh-huh. that's something I saw Pajot doing, uh, William Pajot to do. Uh, how do you think I got it? <laughs> oh, okay. And once again, Bill is in there. Bill's in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, th- th- that was something that came from uh, Tudor Arts. Okay. And uh, it's something that, uh, th- th- you know, when I, when I look at the gift from my time to today, especially when I look at, especially as, as an art teacher, uh, I love the time and the tradition of what I acquired from my time because it was a lot more tactile. You have to draw. When I focus on the things that you have, your perception of how we see things, Mm -hmm. and you look at like some of my students today, and I find it kind of interesting because I'll have them make a greeting card, Mother's Day card. Mm And on our campus, we have these rose bushes. And I try to get, take your cell phone, walk across the campus, look at the actual flower. What do they do? Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to what we were saying before. <laughs> the influence, the influence is just, just Google it. <laughs> yeah, you, there's so much right. that... They look into the box. Right. It's like a virtual reality instead of actually dealing with the actual Real- reality. reality. Yeah, I like reality. I <laughs> yeah. like, you know, to, to, to me, we're, when you think of the time span, our history. Yeah. And as faculty, that's one of the things that I have loved doing, especially, you know, being a LACMA educator is using those galleries. Yeah. To, to go and find information that has, that fills in all the things that you didn't get in school. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing to find when you look at the reality of how artists have worked for centuries. Yeah, uh, you can't. There are certain things that certain sensibilities that we require. Right, you have to be able to see the world around you. And that's such an important thing. You know, I, I advise that even of uh, c- potential collectors who come to me for advice and consultation, to just open up your eyes and your heart. See, that's one of the things and, and, that I've enjoyed with you. And take it in, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank we, you. we go and look together. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, George, man, listen, I want to thank you so much, man, for sharing your perspective with us. Yeah, it's been fabulous, and I, I've loved every minute of it, oh. I, I, and I enjoy my friend. Oh, excellent, and, and, and the feeling is mutual. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. So uh, that closes another uh, episode of Eric's Perspective. I, again, encourage you to subscribe. And uh, we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Mm